Good morning. I'm Megan Fox. I write with pjmedia.com and I found another article that I want to read to you. So this is another episode of I Read to You about Sex in the City and and just like that and the fallout, which just keeps on coming. So let me share this with you. Let me share the screen. Hold on. This article comes from is it Dispatch? Let's see. Defector by Soraria Roberts. And just like that, I watched an entire season of And Just Like That. I have not read this yet, so my reaction will be real time. Uh, and we'll get going here. Every week for the past two months, I have watched the Sex in the City spinoff And Just Like That. And every week, I have felt the same sense of befuddlement at myself. <laughs> Why am I watching this, I think? Every week for the full hour, I'm watching it. Why am I waiting for this? I think every week in the days before I watch it. What the fuck is this? I asked social media, somewhat alarmed after half a season had gone by, before hearing the question echoed back to me from other women, mostly my age. Why do we keep doing this to ourselves? We all asked in unison with slightly deranged laughter. Oh, I can relate. I can relate. Yes. It does. I feel like I'm going crazy. Like I'm in the nut house. It's true. Um, I tried to explain and just like that to a friend. And this is what came out. It's like you took the characters from, an, from 1998 out of circulation and aged them up 20 years physically, 50 years mentally, and then plopped them back into the present day without explaining anything that has happened in the intervening years. There has been some mild grumbling about one of the husbands being treated like a doddering old fool, but none of the main characters in this series seem any less doddering to me. <laughs> It's so true. My glasses are dirty. You guys who wear glasses will understand. Um, I feel like I'm looking through fog. I don't know how they get so dirty so quick. It's the worst. All right. This should be better. Ah, much better. Um, none of them seem less doddering to me. In Sex in the City, these women, quirky columnist and narr narrator Carrie Bradshaw, Sarah Jessica Parker, back like she never left, Button down lawyer Miranda Hobbs, Cynthia Nixon, post politics, preppy art dealer Charlotte York, Kristen Davis, oddly subdued, and PR femme fatale Samantha Jones, the dearly missed Kim Cattrall, who savvily chose not to return this time around, were once more the mature, if fluffier girls of the 90s. Their bottomless bank accounts, Carrie's poverty never got in the way of her haute couture or a Michelin style star meal presented a New York only accessible to the incredibly rich, but implied a New York for the independent every woman who always got her man. Now these same women are stumbling around Manhattan like a gender-flipping reboot of Cocoon, <laughs> even though none of them have even hit 60 yet. It's like the past hedonism upon which this franchise was supposedly built never happened, where the characters have some kind of collective amnesia. I don't care who you are, it's incredibly hard to imagine that in middle age you would forget how to finger someone if you've done it before. <laughs> it's called muscle memory. <laughs> oh, God. But in episode seven of And Just Like That, Miranda's husband of a million years, Steve, a hotter than ever, Dave, David Eigenberg, despite the show's attempt to make his hearing loss his defining feature, appears to paw at his wife's vagina like a baby bear <laughs> cooing. <laughs> cooing. I'm a little rusty, is that right? <laughs> Oh, God, I'm crying. <laughs> I may not be able to get through this. Okay. In the previous episode... <laughs> I'm sorry. In the previous episode, Carrie and Miranda express gleeful shock at Charlotte's disclosure that she still gives her husband blowjobs. Is he dying or something? <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't help but wonder. Had these women just been doing missionary the whole time? <laughs> oh, God. 
No wonder Che Diaz, Sarah Ramirez, the non-binary comedian, only needs a couple of fingers to get Miranda to upend her entire life. I'm going to thank writer Samantha Irby for that particular scene. If you know Irby's writing, you'll know she has a knack for wringing hotness even out of the most absurd situations. I'm sorry, that wasn't hot. Uh, not at all. Not hot. Not hot. And the moment Che gets digital with Miranda in Carrie's kitchen, while the hyper-narcissistic post-hip surgery sex writer is forced to piss into a bottle because of it, incontinence, also very on-brand for Irby, is hands down the hottest of the series. What? No. No. It's perhaps the only hot scene, to be honest, one Irby cannot correct in an entire pre-existing machine built around boomer, boomer sex. It's not hot at all. How can this woman be so on about everything else and so off about that? That scene was grotesque. There is nothing hot about getting off in the kitchen while your best friend is pissing herself. There's That's not hot at all. Ugh. Disagree. Disagree. Moving on. There's no reason for Anne just like that to be this anticlimactic. Three of the original writers, series developer Michael Patrick King, as well as Julie Rottenberg and Elisa Zaritsky, have returned, which made me wonder if 20 years ago I had just missed their ham-fisted handling of life's intersections because of my own ham-fisted handling of life's intersections. And not really. First of all, over six seasons, we're talking about a literal handful of times that anything outside these women's charms, charmed lives is wrestled with. And even that is stretching it. That is the reason for sex in the, that sex in the city is so addictive. It's a quick high. This is a show that introduces a class divide between Miranda's Ivy League attorney and Steve's bartender and then has Carrie's voicing over it. I wondered, was New York really any different from New Delhi? Had our class system been replaced by a caste system? And if so, can we date outside our caste? Completely ignorant and idiotic, but completely within the tone of a bubbly show that waves away anything deeper than a split stiletto or an errant orgasm as swiftly as a stolen puff of a cigarette. Critics have questioned whether a gay white sexagenarian <laughs> like King can meet the current moment, but he couldn't even meet the last one. It's just that anyone who would have complained would have also been ignored at the time. Sex in the City used gay white men and gay white man placeholder Samantha uh, and gay white man's placeholder Samantha to upset the conventions of gender and sexuality, but wasn't particularly bothered with upsetting the status quo itself. So when Carrie dates a bisexual man in season three, she she grouses, when did this happen? When did all, the sexes get all confused? Only to conclude that she's too old to play the game. Actually, I'm stopping it here. I loved that episode. It was so realistic to me as a straight person who's not interested in all of this nonsense. It's a totally normal response for a straight woman to be like, I don't I, I'm not into this. Like, you young people, you know, do what you do. But this is not my scene. And, like, I thought that was very honest. And I loved that show. And I don't think it should be criticized. I don't think heterosexual people ought to be criticized for being heterosexual. Like, come on. It's absurd, this new clown world we live in where um, if you're not attracted to uh, the same sex, then you're just, you know, a phobe of some kind. That's nonsense. And there are a lot of us, a majority of us, who are grossed out by same-sex um, uh, sex, and that's okay. I mean, aren't gay people grossed out by straight sex? I think they are, and that's why they're gay. <laughs> okay? All right, moving on. And that's the point. In the original Sex in the City, it's all a game. It's all over Carrie's bouncy voiceover, the bouncy music, the bouncy cameras, all of it shot through by Samantha's steamy interventions. I don't see color. I see conquest, she says in season three, and you laugh before realizing she's not really joking. Race doesn't affect Samantha, and how it affects anyone else only matters insofar as it affects her, which is to say only in for forgettable spurts, such as the black guy she dates who is under the thumb of his sister, or the black trans sex workers who disrupt her sleep hygiene. Half man, half woman, totally annoying. Jesus Christ. Actually, see, again, I thought that scene was hilarious. I don't know why we can't poke fun of one another anymore without it having to be um, a, an international incident, but it should stop. 
In this series, Asian women work at nail salons or do takeout or role play as servile housekeepers, and LGBTQ people serve as confirmation of the main character's conservatism. There was nothing conservative about these main characters ever, please. Girlfriend, I'm a conservative, I would know. And none of this matters because uh, the froth of a well-placed tutu uh, and a cupcake and the sparkle of a cosmopolitan and a downtown fuck are what its devotees remember. And to be frank, I would take Sex in the City's oblivious, outdated confection over the dour, hyper-conscious tedium of Anne just like that any day. Yeah, because it was fun and funny. It was funny. It's actually funny to be able to poke fun of one another the way that Sex in the City did and not take themselves so seriously. That's what people actually want. Moving on. The paper-thin transgression of Sex in the City was all around white women's sex lives. Today, in a far more transgressive culture, there's nothing left to subvert through these characters. So those women have now become the punchline. Exactly. Exactly. Which we do not appreciate. Everything is about age, and without the effervescent script or direction or Samantha to render it playful, we have a trooper like Parker trying to carry its lightness on her back. Her screwball delivery is welcome, even with less joyful writing, but the weight of the world comes crashing down every time. Everything that was once treated glibly because it was not the point is now the show's only point. Every word has been vetted, every line is constipated. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, so much yes. While the original mandate was to have sex like men, the new one is, we can't just stay who we were, right? And that apparently means a bunch of sad sacks having a woke moment alarm pulled on them <laughs> at every turn. I do feel for Ramirez, who plays Carrie's boss, the host of X, Y, and Me, the podcast that talks about gender roles, sexual roles, and cinnamon rolls. God save us. <laughs> who is stuffed with a mouth full of progressive pedagogy, including their own intro. I'm Jay Diaz, your host and queer, non-binary, Mexican-Irish diva, representing everyone out else outside these two boring genders. Yes, it is boring. The women who were once painting the town tool, making the most of their age and success, are now trapped like butterflies in the domestic sphere. There's, of course, nothing wrong with having a husband and a bunch of kids, except that none of these characters have enough depth to make that life interesting. Let's be real. Half their personalities were the things they wore and the places they went and the people they did. <laughs> now the rare soberness of six seasons crammed into ten episodes. Within the about five minutes, Carrie loses two best friends and a husband. Chris Noth's big was killed off before the, a series of sexual assault allegations against him came to light, and her character is essentially reduced to three, three words. My husband died. Her bon mots have also been reduced to execrable exchanges like young love, not so young, not so love. Charlotte has gone for... Char Charlotte. I can't even read anymore. Charlotte, although Charlotte sounds like Che and Charlotte, a uh, ship, which is funny. Charlotte. Charlotte has gone from art dealer to curator of her own home with newly acquired accessories, including a black best friend, Nicole Airy Parker, trying her best, and a kid who eschews labels. But Miranda bears the brunt of all this modernity. She has been saddled with an extreme case of white guilt and gone from corporate lawyer to human rights student and has in the interim lost her mind. <laughs> I don't remember Miranda ever being a rube, but here she is, shocked her professor has braids and, act, and acts like a drooling undergrad when she hears Che's LGBTQ 101 lecture. It's actually a comedy set called Obviously Check the Box. I think I was just so worried about saying the wrong thing in this climate that I said all the wrong things, she says at one point. Unfortunately, I don't think Anne Just Like That is self-aware enough for that line to read as meta-commentary. Sarita Chudere's real estate broker, Seema Patel, a Samantha replacement, offers a brief flicker of reprieve, but she is neither body enough nor campy enough to pull the rest of the show up. That's yeah, true. It's true. And just like that, set itself up to fail by being afraid of its own nostalgia. Sex in the City was not only defined by what now plays as unseemingly opulence, but a particular brand of white feminism that could be read as progressive at the time, but not always, and less and less as time progressed. 
in its attempt to atone for the Sex and the City's now glaring sins. And again, stop. I disagree with that. I totally disagree. This is all part of that cancel culture where we have to go back 20 years and and rip someone for saying something they said 20 years ago when the times were different, like what they're doing to Joe Rogan right now. Um, it is absolutely ridiculous that anyone should have to apologize for anything they said 20 years ago. And take it for what it is, like it or hate it. And if you don't like it, don't watch it. I mean, we don't need to re... We don't need to drag its corpse up and then beat it to death again, do we? Uh, out of what? So at the time, it actually was uh, something that had never been done before. At the time, it was considered progressive. Um, it just, it was an answer to all of that. Uh, women, you know, men can be portrayed in The Sopranos like, you know, powerful and still, you know, desirable and do be, be doing all these terrible things. Um, and, and it was like the answer to that. And it was funny, like just enough already. Like everybody needs to relax. Everyone turned into the church lady now. And it's really, un, it's, it's unattractive. I mean, nobody wants to be railed at and nagged at constantly. We just want to laugh. All right. Where was I? Where was I? I'm losing my place. Um, now glaring sins. Like, I don't think the sins were glaring. And just like that replaces much of what also made the show so seductive with cloying gestures that misunderstood the present and utterly failed to redeem the past. You can't redeem the past. There's no redeeming the past. The past is the past. It did. Enough. Moving on. While I was never much of a fan of Sex in the City, when I moved to New York a decade after first seeing it, I couldn't help but have those four women on my mind. And because their fantasy life had become mine by cultural osmosis, I felt the same sense of betrayal that a lot of women probably did when reality did not match in the end. Perhaps the impulse to watch in just like that is the same impulse I felt to think of Sex in the City all those years ago. It is nostalgia for the aspiration of my youth before maturity really had hit. And just like that offers only further betrayal. The sanitation, the sanitization of an outdated fantasy. That is to say, not only do women my age have to live with the repercussions of our past actions, and just like that, also subjects our past dreams to retroactive cor correction. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I will not be correcting my past. <laughs> I will be remembering it with joy and happiness. That and I, th this, this is nonsense. All right, sorry, moving on. In that case, one of the last images of its finale is surprisingly fitting. Carrie standing in the middle of a bridge in Paris, resplendent in fuchsia pink satin gloves, and a mess of orange pleated taffeta opens her sparkling purse to reveal it is full of nothing but ashes. I mean, I'm, I, I think this woke um, explanation for why, and just like that is bad. My hair's getting flat. Look at this nonsense. What is happening? I just, Ugh, it's a little crazy today. Um, I think this woke explanation, these people who want to be super woke still and say they hate this because it didn't go far enough or because it went too far in trying to repair past wrongs. There was nothing wrong with Sex in the City. Don't let anyone tell you that. There was nothing wrong with it. It was actually highly entertaining. It was a hit show. People of all races enjoyed it. People of all sexes enjoyed it. There is no, there's no reason to go back and apologize for Sex in the City. And that is actually why this failed. It failed because it tried to apologize for a franchise that was fucking great. Don't do that. All right. Uh, I will see you later. Like and subscribe. Don't forget to do that. And I am working on a really fun. Well, first of all, tune in at 1 p.m. today on Real Housewives Recaps with Jen because we did a collab and it will be on her channel at 1 p.m. on Midnight Toast. I am so happy and thankful to Jen at Real Housewives Recaps for inviting me to do that. It, it's really a lot of fun and you guys are going to really laugh and have a good time at that. I, I deliver my top 10 worst moments of And Just Like That for Jen's video. And then coming up this Friday, I'm putting together a collab 
with some of the best channels that are going, we're going to do an entire video on the worst fashions of Anne just like that. We're going to roast those. Um, and it'll be a Friday premiere video on my channel with a live chat. So per, uh, make sure you stay tuned for that because that's going to be a lot of fun. So coming up next is Real Housewives Recaps at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'll be on there uh, sharing my top 10 worst moments of Anne just like that. Like and subscribe. Talk to you guys later.